Thanks, uh, thanks a lot for, for having me. Um, so this uh, afternoon session is about reinforcement learning. So let me just start with the, um, with the pointer to the slides. Uh, so uh, you can download, hopefully, the slides from uh, this, uh, this link. So you just type short URL dot at slash lowercase fp uh, uppercase jz5 and you should be able to get access to the uh, PDF of the slides that I'm going to use uh, throughout the, uh, the course. And uh, so the course is, is played over two sessions, two half uh, sessions today and two half sessions uh, tomorrow. So with respect to what is written in the calendar, I would not uh, sharply split the, all the theoretical lectures uh, today and the practical sessions tomorrow, things will be more interleaved. So feel free to uh, take your laptop and uh, go to this URL so that you can download the PDFs. And then on the uh, on the slides, there will be also pointers to the uh, notebooks that we will be using for more of the hands-on uh, uh, sessions during the course. Uh, so the organizer explained me that uh, you have access to Mike or to the to the chat for asking questions. Uh, so it might take, you know, on my side, a few minutes to get used to the interaction, but, you know, definitely feel free to interrupt me at, uh, at any point in time. And if anybody can confirm, please, that uh, uh, the uh, link here to the slides works, just to be sure that everything, uh, everybody can get access to the slides. No, so I'm sorry, but uh, we don't have access access to your slides. It is not working. It's not working. Okay, so this oops, something that I wanted to be sure because. Um, let's see. I'm sorry about that, but it's something that I. Uh, okay, so it seems like probably it's a temporary link, the one that is uh, created. Unfortunately, it seems like uh, you know Google has uh, discontinued their service of uh, uh, URL shortener, and uh, this is quite unfortunate. Uh, so I will you know, just uh, work. So let's try this one instead. So probably you should be able to see it. So now it's lowercase h. Capital Q, capital S, 35. Does it work? C'est bon? So yes, it works. Okay, so great. Sorry about this. Um, I will update uh, the, the slides uh, later, but yeah, so this, this is the URL. Okay, so let's, uh, let's get started then. Um, so this is about reinforcement learning, and uh, I would like to uh, start explaining a little bit about uh, why, in some sense, reinforcement learning is an interesting field of uh, artificial intelligence and machine learning in general. And the reason is that there is a set of problems out there that is uh, very important from a practical point of view, and they can be hardly uh, attacked through other tools than reinforcement learning, and I will explain why. Uh, so examples of important problems that uh, are, are becoming actually increasingly more important are things like uh, autonomous robotics, and in autonomous robotics, we have things like elder care, exploration of dangerous environments, robotics for entertainments. Uh, we have problems like finance, where more and more we have automatic bots, trading bots, that are uh, uh, in charge of uh, either executing orders or even uh, managing portfolios in a more autonomous way. 
Uh, and then we have things like resource management, where, uh, for instance, in the case of uh, energy production in a wind farm, uh, we would like to optimize the strategy of how much energy to store in batteries and how much energy to maybe sell back to the to the network provider. And uh, how to do this effectively, of course, it's a very uh, difficult problem because the wind is a, is a you know, fast changing resource and, uh, and this might affect the, uh, uh, the production. And at the same time, even the prices in the market might change very rapidly and in a way which is difficult to predict. Uh, then there are things like uh, recommender systems, uh, which is probably one also the most popular, or it's becoming one of the most popular applications of reinforcement learning, where the problem is to uh, provide users with uh, more personalized uh, recommendations. It can be in terms of products, so movies, film, uh, uh, music, or, or items, or in terms of ads in uh, in uh, in this situation of us recommendation system and uh, in, in some other applications like MOOCs or intelligent tutoring systems, the recommendation part might be in terms of courses, lessons or exercises. And so we would like to help students to progress as fast as possible, uh, depending on their uh, level of knowledge, their style of learning and so on and so forth. Uh, another example is games, uh, and uh, it can be you know board games, it can be computer games where either we want to beat humans or cooperate with humans in a way which feels you know as human as possible, so that people can interact in computer games also with a, a, a non-person characters somehow that uh, uh, look reasonable and useful in the in the dynamics of the game. All of these uh, problems, despite being very different and um, going into very different fields, the fields of robotics, the fields of finance, the fields of energy, they all share somehow a common thread, which is the fact that they're all problems which are oftentimes very difficult to engineer in advance. Uh, so in robotics, you notice that I didn't uh, speak about industrial robotics, where we designed the robot and the context and the environment for one specific task that we very well know in advance, and so that we can you know, engineer the whole problem very carefully. Uh, I talked about autonomous robotics and interaction with humans in terms of you know, robotics for entertainment, where on the other hand, it's super difficult to know in advance exactly what the type of interaction will be, and uh, the autonomy of, of the autonomous robotics is really in the fact of being able to adapt to things that might not be uh, known at design time. In, uh, in the field of finance, although of course there is you know, a huge field of mathematical finance, which is uh, um, focused on, on modeling and creating effective models for 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 the for the market and how the market works and evolves in response of some trading actions uh, still it's very very difficult to model everything in an effective way and also these models usually anyway would come with a lot of parameters that needs to be estimated from the data and we would like somehow to do the estimation of the model and the uh, control of the system more or less at the same time so as to not waste time you know longer uh, uh, parameter estimation uh, uh, phases before actually uh, acting into the system uh, resource management i gave the, the example of the wind this is a resource which is you know intrinsically stochastic non-stationary and similarly for the prices at which uh, our energy can be uh, can be uh, bought and recommender system, yet, yet another example. Uh, of course, the, the system is engineered in the sense that we develop the platform, we know the items that we can recommend. But for instance, the items might change. And definitely, you know, how the users will respond to some recommendations is something super difficult to model up front. And uh, we would rather uh, you know, leverage the amount of data that we have from the interaction with the users to directly learn what are the user preferences uh, and, and how to adjust to them. 
So somehow there is a common thread uh, behind all this, uh, these problems, which is the fact that we have problems which are very difficult to engineer and to perfectly model in advance. And in some, at least of these cases, on the other hand, we uh, can try to learn directly from the data about how to effectively uh, act into these uh, systems, into these environments. So in case of finance, we try different trading, trading strategies and we try to learn which one is the most effective. Same for recommender systems. We try to propose different items to the users and try to understand what are the preferences. And, uh, and so on and so forth. So we would like to set up somehow an approach which is data-driven as much as you know, machine learning is data-driven, but in a more challenging environment where the actions that we take are actual interactions with an environment which might respond to the actions that we do. So this is in contrast, for instance, with, I don't know, uh, computer vision applications or machine learning, uh, for object recognition, where we give a huge data set in input and we have a, a, a very good object detection strategy or object recognition strategy, but somehow the labels that we return from our system do not influence the environment itself. We just receive an image as input, uh, propose a label as output, and that's it. Well, here in all these systems where we will be using reinforcement learning, there is this interaction which keeps going on between the actions that we uh, propose and the reaction of the system. So let me try to you know, summarize basically in one slide what reinforcement is and, and what is the somehow grand goal of, of, of RL. Uh, so reinforcement is about learning how to map states to actions uh, so as to maximize a numerical reward signal in an unknown and uncertain environment. So right in this paragraph, there are a lot of the ingredients that I've kind of mentioned so far. So if you look at the picture on the left, what we are kind of formalizing is a problem where there is a, an agent. So it can be a robot, it can be a recommender system, it can be a virtual agent that uh, uh, perceives something about the current state of the environment. It can be, uh, for instance, in the case of uh, autonomous robotics, it can be all the sensors, the cameras, uh, that uh, uh, keep the, the robot. And then the agent can perform an action, and it can be for the robot moving, for the recommender system recommending an item, for the trading execution system, uh, you know, execute a buy or sell uh, order. And in response to this uh, interaction, two things happen. So one is the fact that the environment will be affected by our action and it will change its uh, current state. Uh, but also it will provide either directly from the environment or somehow internally the agent itself, it will be able to evaluate the quality of that single interaction through what we call a reward signal. Uh, for instance, in the case of trading execution is how much uh, the, the order that we place cost or how much money we made by that. Uh, in other problems like recommend the system, it might be whether the user clicked or, or, or didn't click. In some other problems, it might be also a little bit more blurry. For instance, I, I mentioned intelligent tutoring systems where we propose exercises to users. Well, in that case, what is the reward? It's a little bit more blurry because of course, we could take as a reward just whether the student succeeded or not in that exercise, but maybe this is not exactly what we want to optimize in itself. What we would like to optimize is uh, somehow the learning progress. So there might be cases where indeed what is a reward is a difficult uh, design problem, uh, but there are some other cases where it, it comes naturally from the application. And so the overall aid, uh, objective of an RL agent is to try to find which actions uh, maximize the reward. But there is a second uh, uh, ingredient into reinforcement learning which makes it specifically difficult, which is the fact that in the most interesting and challenging cases, the actions performed by the agent affect not only the immediate reward, but also the next situation and all subsequent rewards. So basically this, what it means is that uh, 
the reward signal is just judging or it's evaluating whether the taking that action at that specific time at that specific state was a good idea or not. But it's not really telling me whether this action was a good action in the long term. So usually I give this example when I when I you know, teach this class and I show this 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 slide is that you know for students to sit down in a class when you know outside it's sunny and and beautiful, well that action is provided with the negative reward, right? Because you're sitting in a dark room and listening to this stuff instead of you know going outside and having fun, uh, which would be immediately more rewarding. And on the other hand, the belief or the hope that we have is that by taking this current action, which is assigning, which is assigned with a sort of negative reward, you will be able to change the state of the environment, which in your case, it might be your learning, your knowledge about reinforcement learning, to a better state, to a better situation, which will in the future possibly allow you to collect more reward because you will be more knowledgeable about these technologies and you will be able to solve problems of interest uh, uh, later on. So, so how the uh, strategic part of, of RL is about the fact that we don't want to be maximizing just the immediate reward, but also the access to possibly large rewards in the future by changing the current state of the environment. And then just to make the whole thing you know, more difficult, uh, the agent is not told which actions to take, but it must discover which actions yields the most reward by trying them. So this uh, is an aspect of reinforcement learning, which is not always true in all algorithms, in all settings, but most, let's say in the most proper sense of reinforcement learning, this is uh, uh, another of the challenges which is the fact that we don't get any supervision. So in, in supervised learning, uh, you're used to say, oh, I, I'm given a huge data set. Probably this morning you have seen a few of these examples in deep learning where you know, I'm given a huge data set of uh, you know, input and labels, uh, images and labels, uh, sentences and labels. In RL, it's not the case. So what we actually get is only what we try to do. Right, so we are in a state, we try an action, we observe the immediate reward, which again, it might not even be the full story, but you know that's the only thing that we observe when we do pure enforcement learning. We are uh, bound somehow to the experience that we collect through the uh, interaction with the environment. And so if the learning process, or what you know, usually supervised learning is just, you know, optimizing an objective function, uh, now it's a little bit more subtle because we also have to interact with the system in a way which will collect the data that we use to train our strategy, our, 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 uh, our strategy of interaction with the environment. So basically this you know, kind of summarizes all the features of reinforcement learning, the big promise somehow, but also the big challenges of uh, what reinforce, reinforcement learning is about. So what this um, uh, this course is going to be about, we, so we are going to try to explain a little bit how to model reinforcement learning problems. So really the, you know, the foundational part of, of reinforcement learning uh, from a statistics point of view. And then we will learn how to solve reinforcement learning problems, uh, both exactly, and, and so this will be the, less, the, the least learning part of the course, I would say. And then we will rather focus more on the um, uh, incremental uh, learning, how to solve things approximately by blending reinforcement learning with deep learning. And uh, if we have time, so uh, the timing here is off, right? I mean, I, I, I was starting trying to find a proper segmentation for the timing, but I, for sure I will not respect it this way. So if we get uh, some time also uh, studying a little bit the trade-off of exploration exploitation. So as I was mentioning at the beginning, I will try to integrate a little bit the, the, the slides with also a little bit more events on and, and practical sessions so that we, you know, we learn more also by doing and not by just looking at the slides. Uh, so these links should be up to date, hopefully, if they work. Um, 
Otherwise, I will provide the links then on, on each of the slides where, uh, where the link is needed. So just to be sure everybody's on the same page and everything is working, you know, just let me know if there is any question. Otherwise, I will move to the first, let's say, pack of slides. Any questions? No, no question now. So I think you can continue. Okay, great. The only thing is when okay, you are great. showing your PDF, can you just uh, uh, go to uh, plein écran? Full screen? Full screen? Yes, okay. Okay, I will do it, yeah. Yeah, I was not doing it because sometimes I have problems with uh, taking notes, but, but this way should be better, right? Yes, it's perfect, thank you. Okay, great. Okay, thanks. Okay, so let's start with the, the, the how to formalize uh, uh, reinforcement learning problems. So uh, what we said is that we have an agent, uh, perceives the state of the environment, performs actions, and then, okay, in the reinforcement learning, uh, let's say textbooks, sometimes we say that the reward is provided by a critic, which might be part of the environment, might be you know, hand-coded or hard-coded into the agent itself, this doesn't really matter somehow. So what we care about is that the learning agent is provided with some reward signal. Uh, let me start with an example, uh, and I will be using this example throughout uh, a few slides. Uh, so I will take this, uh, which is uh, for those that still know what Atari is, it's, it's a console with you know, from the 70s, I think even from the 80s. And this is the breakout game where you have a paddle in, in the, the bottom and you have a ball and you want to destroy the, the wall uh, by letting the, the ball hit in the, the, the different bricks. So, okay, let's uh, say that the agent here is the paddle, which is the only thing that you can actually move. The environment is the ball and the bricks. Uh, and the reward is the number of points that we are doing at each time step. So. So how do we formalize this problem? Uh, the most convenient, and I want to stress here convenient, uh, because you know, as, as all models, it has a series of, of drawbacks and limitations, but a very convenient way to formalize this type of problems is to assume that this agent environment reward interaction can be formalized through a Markov decision process. Uh, so if you're familiar with Markov chains, this is just a Markov chain where we add actions. Otherwise, you can just you know, uh, uh, directly see what it means from, from this slide. We just say that the environment uh, can take different states, and we list them in the, in the S state space. The A agent can perform actions from an action space. And then, and this is uh, one of the crucial, crucial things that we say is that uh, whenever we are in a state, uh, time t, let's say, Whenever we are in the state S uh, here and we perform an action A, the way the environment reacts is by transitioning to a new state, which here we call S prime as time T plus one. And uh, the transition happens uh, as regulated by a, a stochastic process. So you see that basically here we are saying for any state S prime, the probability that S prime is going to be the next state when we start from S and we take action A has some probability. So it means the transitions do not happen deterministically, but they can have some noise in it, in some sense. So a typical example is of this is that you know when I robot, I give a comment, you know, move forward. Then whether I move uh, you know, in one step, let's say uh, I move by one centimeter, one centimeter dot one, zero dot one centimeters, well, there is a little bit of stochasticity in the output, out, outcome of my action. And this we will capture it by saying that there is a transition probability that describes how the environment, state environment uh, reacts to my, uh, to my actions. And then there is the very important ingredient, which is the reward here, which says that starting from state A as taking action A, and transitioning to the next state as prime 
is associated with the reward, which is this much. So you see that this is also somehow the most general formulation that I can have of, of a reward. Valid definitions are also you know, functions that only uh, depend on SNA, which to ease the notation is the type of uh, uh, formulation that I will be using uh, most of the time. But we can also have reward functions which only depend on the current state or only depend on S prime. So you know there are many different ways that we can formalize the concept of reward. This is the most general one. What is really important here is to stress that it does depend only on this transition. It doesn't look at what I've done in the past. It doesn't look at what I will do in the future. It's really just instantaneous atomic for this uh, uh, current transition. Yeah, so as I was saying, most of the time I will be using R of SA in these notes just to really simplify the notation. Um, and so basically when, you know, I, when I execute an agent somehow, I'm in a state S1, I perform an action A1 at time one, then S2, I assume that will be generated by this uh, Markov decision process, and so on and so forth. Then I will have a new state, I will take a new action, and this will uh, keep on rolling through trajectories. What I will be calling trajectories, just uh, one uh, realization of this process. Okay, so I, I would like to you know, stress uh, all the limitations of this model, uh, uh, just to be sure that you know, we understand that as all models, we are you know, enforcing some assumptions here that might or might not hold in practice. But again, you know, we have to make some assumptions to be able to do something reasonable. Then whether our methods will work beyond these assumptions or not, this is a more an empirical question. So the first uh, strong assumption that we make is the Markov assumption. So what I said in the previous slide is the fact that uh, the, the way the environment behaves uh, is stochastic but it only depends on the previous state and the action that I perform. It does not depend at all on, on what happened you know, in the past, t minus one, t minus two, the actions that I performed then, doesn't really matter. And so we assume that basically st is a sufficient statistics for the evolution of the state together with the current action. Just to give an example where this, of course, it doesn't make any sense, is the, is the trading execution problem. Basically, what the, if ST is the price, so imagine it's the price of, of the stock at time T, then what I'm saying is that the price at T plus one will only depend on the current price and the action that I perform, which can be, I don't know, buy or, or sell. Okay, so this clearly doesn't make sense because we perfectly know that the markets, they have memory, it might even be a long memory. And so definitely, usually what we, ST, what ST plus one will depend on is also ST minus one, ST minus two, which are the history of the prices. Now, of course, we can always redefine the concept of state as the set of observations, the set of prices, for instance, that I've seen from T back to, let's say, T minus K time instance. In this case, what we are saying is that we don't have a Markov decision process, we have a K order Markov decision process as much as K order Markov chains, if you're familiar with that. So there are other, plenty of other assumptions that we can uh, uh, do to relax this type of, of scenario, but this is the one that we will be working with throughout the, the class. And it's the kind of, you know, uh, the basic of all, all reinforcement learning methods. Uh, so just to you know, also give another illustration of why this doesn't work usually, imagine that I, I go back to this type of example, and so what you see is the current image, it's the paddle is here, the ball is here, and I see that I do not move, right? So I keep the paddle as it is, I don't move on the left, I don't move on the right. So are you able to guess what is gonna be the next state, right? So do I have enough knowledge summarized by these two things 
to be able to add to randomness, so can I put a distribution over what is going to be the next state? Well, the answer is no, because I have no idea where the ball is moving, right? So if I just take this, this steel frame of the current position of the ball, I have no idea whether you know, the ball is moving downward, upward, in which direction exactly, at which speed. And so it's basically impossible to predict what's going to happen next. So this would be a typical example of a non-Markov system. But now imagine that I define ST as the uh, conjunction of four consecutive frames. Then I have the position, I have the velocity, I have the acceleration. And so since the, uh, in this case, the game, uh, uh, say, uh, uh, is, is, is working according to basic dynamic laws, then it's super easy to predict even exactly what's going to be the position of the ball, and I even don't have any uncertainty about it. But then it means that, again, I have to be careful about what I call a state. So in reinforcement learning, it's really critical when we formalize a problem to try to define a state as something that hopefully will make our dynamics as Markov as possible. So this is the first requirement that we have in the definition of the problem. The second assumption we are making here is that time is discrete. Uh, this I will you know, just go very quickly over it. Of course, it's, a, it's an assumption. Most of the time, reality is kind of continuous. Uh, there is a lot of extensions of MDPs and to some extent also RL to uh, continuous time systems. I will really not spend uh, uh, time on this, but uh, Let's say that you know most of the time again it's a design choice, not necessarily an, an easy one uh, to discretize time uh, in, in which unit. Uh, but again, with enough knowledge of the, the of the problem, it can be done quite safely. And there are problems where you know the the discrete time is intrinsic in the problem, so we don't really have to do anything on our side. Uh, but, you know, again, let me just illustrate why in some cases it might be a little bit tricky to do. Uh, so imagine that, you know, I'm, I'm again in this situation and I perform action left. If I have a very, very teeny tiny time resolution, then now forget about the ball. We're not caring about the ball for, for the moment. Let's just look at the, at the paddle. If I have a very fine grained resolution for my time, Basically, I can barely see that I'm moving on the left, right? So from t to t plus one, yes, it moves a little bit on the left, but maybe it's too fine grained, right? So this one, it might correspond to, you know, I don't know, a fraction of a second, and this does not move enough to be sensible. Otherwise, I can, you know, put a plus one here where this one is maybe five seconds. And then, sure, I can observe the outcome of my action very clearly, but maybe at this point I'm not able to control the system enough. Because if every time I take an action left, I wait five seconds to then decide what to do next, it might not be controllable anymore, the system, and I might not be able to do any, any, good, uh, uh, any good strategy. And so somehow, again, you know, what is this unit of time? Uh, it's usually the discretization of the continuous time or a very, very high frequency control process that we have to take such that we can still control the system, but we don't overdo it in the sense, you know, too high frequency of control. Because otherwise, both the control and the learning will be increasingly more difficult. Uh, last assumption that we had is about the, uh, sorry, next to last assumption that we have is about the reward. So basically, as I was saying, the reward is just the instantaneous quality of what I'm doing, and uh, it should still capture what I want to do, what is the implicitly the objective of the problem, in the sense that the objective of our enforcement learning algorithm is to accumulate as much reward as possible over the long run. And so rewards should somehow encode properly the objective. So in some cases, it's trivial. As I was saying, for instance, in the Atari game, it's points. 
that I collect. So the more points I collect, the happier I am. That's fine. You know, it's trivial to define a reward and uh, uh, maximizing the cumulative sum of rewards is what I want to achieve. But imagine that I want to let a reinforcement learning algorithm learn uh, to drive uh, an autonomous car, an autonomous vehicle. Then what is the reward? It becomes incredibly difficult. So one three, three key, one simple thing is to say, okay, I give you a reward of uh, minus 100 when you, you know, crash the car or reward of zero when you don't crash. Of course, this is not a good strategy because if I optimize for this reward, I will just barely not crash, but probably I would just not move, right? So don't do anything. Okay, so then I give you a reward of uh, you know, one when you move closer to the destination. Now, this is also dangerous because then it means that I would just try to speed as much as I can to reach the destination uh, as fast as possible without crashing. But this might not be desirable because there are traffic lights, there are you know, uh, pedestrians, there are the, the, co the code of, 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 of the road to respect. So this is also not a good reward. Okay, so maybe I give minus 100 when I crash, minus 10 when I do something which is not you know, uh, correct from the uh, road code po point of view, and still I give a mild reward to get closer. Okay, maybe this is a bit better, but still it might not be very comfortable to the to the passenger the way I drive, right? Because I might you know brake very fast, accelerate very fast. Oh yeah, okay. But how do I encode this in the reward? It's very tricky. So there are problems where defining, let's say, decomposing our intuition of what a good policy is into a reward function is super tricky. So uh, this is a limitation of the of the of the problem. There are ways to still understand what is a good reward function, maybe by direct examples from experts. But this is what uh, inverse reinforcement learning is about, and we will not discuss about this uh, during the course. Last uh, but not least, assumption that we're making, which is also very strong, is that if you notice, I use this little p. Uh, to summarize this uh, probability of transition. But here I'm doing something which is very carefully hidden, which is the fact uh, on the uh, right-hand side here I have a T, and on the left-hand side here I don't have a T. So implicitly I'm making a stationarity assumption, saying that you know, the law that governs how the environment works is time invariant. If you're at state, sorry, here the notation is, is, is changed, so here it was S, the state previously. So if I'm in a state X and an action A, it doesn't matter when this happens, the way the environment will react to, stature, to action A will always be the same in probability, uh, and so the time does not affect this. What does it mean? It means that basically I'm purely stationary. Uh, you know, I don't have to convince you about the fact that the reality is hardly stationary. It's most of the time non-stationary. And how to integrate non-stationarity into this model and into reinforcement learning systems, it's, it's not trivial. But there are, again, also ways of trying to uh, mitigate uh, the strength of this assumption and possibly in being able to, uh, to deal with non-stationary problems. Are there any any questions about about this? So maybe the best way to you know, try to see whether there are there are questions about this is uh, um, to try to do an exercise. So we can you know, do it uh, do it together. Uh, the idea is that you know I gave here a semi formal description of a problem. And we just take a couple of minutes, not five minutes, just, just a couple for you to, to think about it and, uh, and see how it could be formalized as a market decision process. So the problem reads as, as follows. So at each month T, a store contains ST items of a specific goods, and the demand for that goods, which is unknown at the beginning of the month, 
is DT. So the demand basically means how many people would like to come to my store and buy and buy items. Uh, at the end of each month, the manager of the store can order 80 more items from the supplier. And so this is the action that we can perform. Furthermore, what we know is that uh, there is a cost of, uh, of maintenance of, of our uh, uh, store, of our inventory, and it's a function of the state, H of S. There is a cost of submitting an order of A items, which is captured by these functions, capital C of A. And of course, there is an income associated to selling items, which is F of Q. Uh, we make a simplifying assumption, which is that if the demand is bigger than an available inventory, so the number of items, then customers just cannot be served and they leave. Uh, then ignore this, this value of the remaining inventory in case we will see it later. Uh, we have a constraint, which is the fact that the store has maximum capacity M. And of course, what we care about is to maximize some measure of profit. And profit means that you know, we want to gain more money than the money that we spend to make the, the, the shop uh, work. So just, just a couple of minutes, and then if anybody wants to volunteer to you know, share their ideas, uh, the answer is in the next slide, but you know, if you can think about what is the state space in this case, what is the action space, what is what, how we could formalize the transition, and it's tricky in this problem, it's not trivial, but how a market decision process transition model P could be uh, uh, formalized to capture this type of problem, and then what is the reward function? So I'll give you really just two minutes, uh, think about it, and then again, there is anybody who wants to share ideas, uh, I'm happy to, to hear your thoughts. And of course, if there are questions, yeah, go ahead with them. So first, is there any question here or online? No? Okay, so let's think about uh, the question. And also online, if you want to turn on your mic and directly ask question or directly give answers, it's completely possible. So feel free to do it. So, Alessandro, you have a question on the chat yeah. from Clément. Yeah. Okay. C can you see it? Uh, yes. Let me just look here. So, it is unknown at the beginning of the... Yes. So, the question is about the uh, DT here. So, we... So, the manager uh, 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 does not know how many people will show up in the shop during the month T. But of course, what I can observe at the end of the month, I know how many items I had at the beginning. I see how many items I had at the end. So I know how many I sold somehow. And then I can reintegrate uh, partially by submitting an order 80. OK, thanks. another 30 seconds and then we can discuss a little bit about it uh, together. You have another question on the chat. Okay. Uh, if DT is bigger than ST, then we can sell it and have income F on ST, or we cannot match the demand. So we cannot match the demand, uh, which means that we will be selling as many as we can, and um, and we will get the income related to what we, we sold. What is not met in terms of demand is lost somehow, but we don't get any penalty for it uh, somehow, just an opportunity lost.
Okay. So I think we can, you know, maybe interact a little bit on this. Uh, is there anybody who who's willing to share um, ideas, thoughts about how to frame this into a, um, uh, an MDP, a market decision process? Any thoughts? Even you know, people online, if you want to unmute and, and share your thoughts. Again, it's in the next slide, but you know, it's mostly for for us to. You know, discuss a bit because there are, by the way, there are multiple ways that we can formalize this. So, so he's someone here wants to begin to answer. Okay, so maybe I can, you know, uh, move to this slide where where there is a sketch of a possible. Uh, possible way of formalizing this. And, and again, if you have questions or, or doubts or alternatives, I think that's, uh, 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 that's the right moment on how to share also your, uh, your perspective on this. So, okay, the state space, in this case, we have items, let's say that items are discrete, and we know that our uh, storage is capped to M, so the state space can take values between zero and M discrete values. The action space, okay, so the action space is also constrained to M in the sense that it doesn't make sense to order more things that I can possibly fit into the storage. Uh, here I just want to point out one small variation to the model that I mentioned so far, which is the fact that in some cases, the action space can also be made state dependent, saying that the actions that are available might not be always the same depending on the state. And here, I could very well uh, constrain the action space to be between zero and capital M minus S, because of course, if I already have S items in my, in my shop, and, and I know that it's limited to M, it doesn't make sense to order more than than the capacity anyway. So somehow the uh, um, the the point of this is to reduce the search space or the, the things that are possible uh, exploiting the prior knowledge we have about the problem. Then okay about the dynamics. Here there are plenty of ways to to formalize things. Also a little bit how to you know how you interpret the indices of time. Usually this creates a little bit of confusion, but let me interpret it this way. Um, so we are time t, and the remaining amount of uh, uh, items from month t minus one we call it st. Right. So this is what the manager let's say, observe uh, uh, when, you know, it closes the, uh, the, the, the previous month. Then it submits this many, uh, the order for this many items. Uh, if we sum them together, this is the amount of items that I will have when I open my shop uh, this month. And then, again, the transition to ST plus one will be by subtracting how many items I sell during this uh, uh, this month, All right? So we can basically say that roughly speaking, now here it's written, you know, with the truncation to zero if the demand is larger than what we have in storage. But you know, roughly speaking, the, the the meaning is that we had this many, we ordered this many, we sold this many. This is what is remaining for at the beginning of next month. Uh, next month. Now. Unfortunately, this is not really the way we define market decision processes, right? So what we said is that we want to define what is the probability that ST plus one is taking a specific value given ST equal to S and AT equal A. So we have to kind of fit back this equation into this. And in order to do that, uh, re remember that here we are forcing two assumptions. One is the Markov assumption, and the second one is the stationary assumption. So one way to satisfy the assumptions and still kind of having this type of thing is to say, okay, this is a random number, right? So what I, I'm, I'm defining here, the probability, this probability here, 
I can basically rewrite it as the probability that uh, uh, st plus at minus dt will take a specific value as prime. Okay, so what I can do now is basically to say, okay, this is just the probability that dt is equal, I'm just, you know, uh, uh, moving right inside somehow, it's equal to s prime minus st minus at given st at. Okay, so this is now just a number. Let's call it little t, little d. So I'm saying, what is the probability that this random variable takes this number? And this number I can, you know, always list all the possible numbers that this variable can take. And what I'm assuming is that this, uh, the, the value that the t will take will only depend on the previous month somehow, and it does not change with the time index. Okay, super easy way of satisfying this is just to say that dt is an IID variable, so it depends on identically distributed from a fixed distribution, which does not even depend on state and actions, and the mark of decision process assumption will be satisfied. But this also shows somehow, again, how constraining these assumptions possibly are. Then, last, uh, last ingredient is the reward, but this is Somehow the easier one is negative cost of the order that we submit, negative cost of storing these many items, plus positive cost of the number of items that we actually sold. So this is you know, very intuitive. This is the per month profit or loss that we have uh, uh, depending on how much items we sold, how many we, we bought, and the cost also of maintaining them. Are there any questions about this way of formalizing the problem? So, so yes, already on the chat, you have two questions. The first one by Clément, yeah. asking why is okay, it more one, convenient for the action space to be space dependent instead of setting so some probabilities that, equal to zero? And then one of Jeremy. So the, the, the reason is, honestly, it's uh, complexity. In the sense that, so now let's move one step forward into the uh, learning problem. We have a learning agent that has to learn which actions are good. And so if I prune the number of actions that I can take, well, that just makes my life easier, right? I don't have to try out many things to just discover that they are totally ineffective or they are not even possible. So if I have prior knowledge about what is possible, what is reasonable, uh, then you know, let's just inject this prior knowledge into the into the way we formalize the algorithm uh, as well. Second question is: Could we put thanks? Uh, could we put DT in the state space as well? This makes the dynamics more cool when actions depend on the demand. Uh, okay, this this is a very interesting question. So the question is: Okay, why don't we you know do something like let's call it X? So why don't we call this the state of the environment? Well, the issue is that this guy is not observable. So what we call state, it must be something that is at time t is observable to the agent, let's say. DT is not. Uh, and, and in that sense, we cannot integrate it into a state. Um, so that's somehow there is a, we could put ST minus one. This we can do it. But dt, which is something that will happen from this moment on in some sense, is not known at time t to the agent, and so it cannot be integrated into the definition of the state. Does it uh, reply to, to the question, Jeremy? Okay, thanks. Anybody in the room? Yes, there is, there is a, a question. question. Yes. Yeah, sorry, I have a, um, a small question on your uh, f function. Could you go back to the slide where you, you, uh, what you put inside your f function, you're taking the positive part of st plus a t minus uh, s. No, there, uh, this, um, in the reward, reward function at the end, uh, I was wondering in uh, how this could be a negative value 
so may you take just the positive of what is inside the function f. Uh, yeah, so let me, let me just think quickly about it. Um, no, this, this doesn't, you're right, does it make sense? And this is always positive. So this is always um, positive? Because okay. Sorry? Okay, yeah, okay, so it's, so it's always a positive quantity. Yeah. Okay, makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Thank let you. Let me just uh, maybe explain one thing since since you're asking about this. So you remember that the definition that we had about the reward function was the function of S A and S prime. So the reason why I didn't put here DT, I could have you know just said this. Well, first because maybe we didn't meet you know the whole demand, but you know even if we forget about that. Uh, the reason why I don't want to write it this way is because dt, again, is not... So here I can only express the function as a function of state actions and as a state. So things that are directly observable by the agent, while dt is not part of the state, it's not part of the actions, and so it's something that can be deduced but not something that I can write explicitly in the reward function, right? It's not something that I can imagine really you're writing the code, something I can pass to the function because it's not observable somehow. So this is just also to explain why it's written maybe in this way. Any other question? Okay, so there is no other question. So this is just you know to help us in, in start reasoning in the language of of reinforcement learning and market decision processes. Now let's move uh, you know uh, quickly. Uh, so by the way, the, there is a break at uh, three. Half past three. Half past three. Okay, so we have half an hour uh, before the break. Okay, so the other ingredients that we want to uh, to introduce now to make to formally define what we are trying to solve with the reinforcement learning is two ingredients. So the first one is what we call usually a policy. So if you remember the very first slides, I was mentioning the objective of reinforcement learning is to map states to actions. So we will call this mapping a policy. More precisely, this is in the family of deterministic stationary policies deterministic because whenever we are in a state S, we will always take that action A, and stationary is because what we do at time T will not be different from what we do at time T plus one. So as soon as this is equal to S, if S T plus one is equal to S, then the action that we will be mapping to is still A, right? So the, the mapping doesn't evolve over time, so it's stationary. There are other options like stochastic or history dependent policy. We will not look at them. We will just you know, focus on these type of things. Then of course, we will be studying learning algorithms where the policy will change over time in response to the learning algorithm. But otherwise, what we will be calling policy is really just what to do in which state. So alternatively, you can think about it really as a you know, piece of code which is saying if state is equal to s1 then action a1 you know return action a1 else if uh, state equal s2 then action a2 and so on and so forth so it's really just uh, you know a long list of mapping between states and and, and actions nothing more uh, so just to give an example so uh, we could, you know, think about uh, things like this, and I will not discuss about this one because anyway, we'll see an example then in the code. Uh, so, for instance, we could say that the policy in the previous example is not doing anything, so it's not ordering any item unless the amount of items that we have in our shop falls below one fourth of the capacity. So we have you know, our capacity up to from zero to M. If at the current time we have just this many uh, uh, things, then we submit an order and we submit an order which is as big as 
m minus s. So s is the number of items that we have, m minus s is gonna be the order that we place. So for instance, this is a policy. So I don't do anything until s falls below a certain threshold, and when this, thre this threshold is, is uh, passed, I just refill completely my, my store. This is an example of a policy. And you see that it just depends on the current state, nothing else. Okay, then finally, how do we evaluate whether a policy is good or not? And uh, uh, informally, what I said is that the objective of RL is to cumulate as much reward as possible. Now, let's formalize this concept through the notion of value function in the setting of infinite time uh, with discount. So there are a lot of you know, terminology here to parse. So we are talking about value functions and we are given a policy pi and we want to give a score to it. We want to say how good that policy is. Now, the first thing that we have to keep in mind is that unfortunately we cannot really give it a one score. We cannot give it one scalar because the amount of reward that I can possibly accumulate, it depends on which state I start from. And that's the reason why the value function is actually a function and it's a function of the state. So basically this is saying how much reward I can accumulate if I execute policy pi starting from S and then you know, accumulate for, uh, 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 for the future. Okay, so what is this future and how long that future is? Well, the future is infinite time. So we, we don't have any specific horizon of evaluation. We just say, you know, from this moment on, how much reward can you get? This usually, it might be a new posed question. So imagine that um, uh, I can, you know, the, the rewards that I can collect are all strictly positive for all states and actions. Then if I'm asking how much reward I can accumulate over time from time zero to infinity, well, the answer is infinite, right? So it would be ill-posed. No matter which actions I do, since the reward is strictly positive, I will be just accumulating positive numbers up to infinity and that's it. So what we usually do, and then it also has different interpretations, is actually to consider an infinite horizon but where we discount the reward that I will obtain at time t by a discount factor which uh, decays uh, geometrically with the horizon. So this gamma is a number which is between zero and one, one excluded, and it's saying, well, the reward that you get at time zero, it's important. The reward that you get at time one is gamma important. The reward that you get at time two is gamma squared important. So I'm basically giving less and less importance to the rewards that I observe in the future. And now this, as soon as this guy here is upper bounded by you know, uh, non-infinite, non so it's, it's, it's really upper bounded, then this will also be uh, uh, a bounded series because I have this geometric discounting, so I have a geometric series and I can easily show that this is actually upper bounded by R max over uh, one minus gamma. It's really just geometric series, right? I'm upper bounding each of these ingredients by R max. And so I have the infinite sum of gamma to the T and this we know that it's one over one minus gamma. So you can interpret this in multiple different ways. The first one is that, okay, it's just a neat mathematical trick to make this series convergent and the seed but it actually uh, conveys a lot of sense and a lot of design choices. So imagine that I'm you know, running my reinforcement learning algorithm for trade execution for portfolio management. It's difficult to say that I want to maximize my revenue in the next I don't know, month, but maybe month and a half, two months. Uh, oh, well, maybe there is a good chance of you know, profiting from the market in two months and five days, so maybe I should, you know, define the quality of my policy over longer horizon. 
So it's difficult to say that there is a specific horizon that I care about. But for sure, if you tell me that my uh, portfolio optimization strategy is good in the infinite horizon, well, maybe I don't care, right? Because you know, infinite is just way too far in the future. And so what I do is basically just, just say that I soft uh, value, so I don't put a hard threshold of time. I just say that you know things that happen earlier are more important, things that happen later are less important. And, uh, and so this is where the, the rationale somehow behind this cumulative sum of these kind of rewards. Then there is another bunch of ingredients. So the first one is that, as we said, the initial state, it must be S, right? It's the, the argument of the function in the left-hand side. Now, the issue is that, uh, as we said at the beginning, this sequence of states and the associated rewards is stochastic, right? Because these are random realizations from our Markov decision process. So if I just stick to this cumulative sum, this is a random variable. And so I need a quantifier to say, okay, I evaluate my policy over the average of the cumulative sum of discounted rewards. And that's where this expectation comes from. It's just averaging out the stochastic transitions that happen whenever I, I execute my policy. So just to summarize, I evaluate the quality of a policy by saying, if I start from S and I execute the actions, so you see that he, these are the actions prescribed by my policy, I will be cumulating discounted on average this much reward. And this we will be calling value functions. Uh, so these are you know, a lot of ingredients, but it's really one of the key uh, points in, in, in defining uh, uh, in a proper way the uh, optimization problem that the reinforcement learning is trying to solve. Uh, and so now we can you know, convincingly say that the objective of a reinforcement learning algorithm would be to try to find the policy that maximizes the value function. That's the the reasonable way we have a properly defined stochastic process generating the samples, how the environment works. We define how the agent behaves through these deterministic policies. We have a score function which defines how good that policy is. We, all we are left with is an optimization problem which says let's maximize over pi. Now, if you're careful, there is a, you know, a, a, a subtle thing that I'm doing here, which looks like cheating, because I stress very much that this is a function of states. And then here, out of the side, I say, oh, I want to find the policy that maximizes the value function. Does it make sense, right? So, uh, because the value function is a function of state. So, what does it mean to maximize the value function? No, fortunately for us, and it's a result that I'm not going to prove, uh, it turns out that something like this happens in, in, in reinforcement learning. So let me uh, just give uh, an example, numerical example, just to illustrate. Imagine that I have a problem with two states, and I give you two policies, pi 1 and pi 2. It can very well be the case that these if I evaluate its value function, so in, the, in each cell, I will put V pi of S. The value of executing pi 1 starting from S1, it might be, I don't know, six uh, uh, units of reward, right? of accumulated, discounted, average reward. Well, if I execute policy 2, policy 2 would get, I don't know, 4. But in S2, it might very well be that this guy takes a 3, and this guy takes maybe a seven. Okay, so now what is the optimal policy? Or what is the better policy between the two? Well, I have to define a way. I say, well, I don't know that maybe I like S1, and so I would say pi one, maybe I like S2, and then I would say pi two, or maybe I average out the performance over S1 and S2. So this would become a matter of definition, and you know, it would become, um, debatable, somehow, the choice that we make. Now, fortunately for us, in reinforcement learning, there exists a policy, always, that is strictly dominating uh, all the other policies. So it would take here, for instance, a 6, and here a 7. 
or let's say, you know, seven and an eight or whatever other score. So you see that at this point, there's no doubt about which one is the best. Pi star is strictly dominating pi one and pi two. And so it's the best policy. So if I consider the family of all possible deterministic policies, it turns out that there exists at least one which is non-dominated in all states, in the sense that you know, it will achieve the largest possible score in all states, no matter what. And in this sense, this formulation that I had before without this, it's kind of well posed because indeed there, I can uh, say that the optimal policy is optimizing the value function component-wise on all uh, uh, components of, of VPI. And again, this is a little bit tricky to prove. It's, it's not a trivial, uh, a trivial result, but you know, fortunately for us, it's, it's true. And so this makes somehow our life a little bit easier. Uh, just in terms of notations, I will be denoting with star everything that is related to optimality. So pi star will be the optimal policy. And the value function associated to the policy pi star, I will call it the optimal value function, and I will be denoting it with v star, just as a shorthand of v pi star. Okay, so we have uh, you know, a few minutes before, uh, before the break, so I would like to start with uh, you know, an example uh, where you, you, know, you can, oh, okay, first question. So there is a link here, hopefully it works. So if you click on the link, you should be able to be redirected to a Colab notebook. So please let me know if this is the case, otherwise I will try to fix it. Should be uh, teleported to this uh, notebook. Does it work? Yes, okay, great. Okay, so uh, very quickly through the code, it's not really important, and then you know you look much into it. So this is just simulating the inventory problem that we had just seen as an example, and um, so the, the the first block is uh, you know just defining a little bit how the cost is defined, how the profit, you know, the gain that we get from selling is defined the cost of the storage, the value of our warehouse, and so on and so forth. And then I define two possible policies. One which is policy constant refill, which is saying, okay, if these are you know, the number, not the number of items in my shop, I will just take maximum number of items minus not current number of items, and this is the order that I submit. And then there is another policy which is called policy refill under threshold, which is the one that I showed before, it says when the number of items falls below a th certain threshold, fill up this, the, the shop again by, by ordering this many, otherwise just don't do anything. And then there is a piece of code where uh, we simulate these, these policies. So the way uh, it's done now, let me maybe just uh, use this one to illustrate. So basically uh, we start from January, and then you know we move to February and so on and so forth. So here, just for my convenience, I consider a finite horizon. So that little t, which in the value function was going from one to infinity, it will go from zero to eleven. It's the number of months in a year. And so this is the inner loop here. Oh, sorry. Here I put it in terms of weeks, but not in terms of months. I apologize. I forgot about that. So it's going to be. Uh, yeah. 51, 51 weeks, so January first week, uh, January second week, and so on and so forth. Um, and then there is an outer loop which is over years, because I, you know, since the, you know, the value that I get over a year, it might be a little bit stochastic because of the demand, which is stochastic. I will repeat this over uh, you know, years, so year 2000, 2001, 2002, for a few years. So the outer loop is this one, and the inner loop is the weeks, right? I'm, I'm simulating multiple years, and each year is, is built of uh, a, a bunch of weeks. 
so the way here, the, you know, the code is just simulating the interaction in the sense that we start for a full from a full capacity uh, uh, situation, and then we call a specific policy. Let's say that we will start with the one which constantly refills stuff. Uh, I call the policy. It gives me the order size, and then the, uh, the, the output of the order, of course, is just the minimum between n plus the order kept at max item. Then I simulate by you know, just drawing at random a specific demand. I compute the number of items that I actually uh, sell. I compute the number of items that are remaining, I compute the gain associated to it, which is gonna be a combination of the gain of the things that I sell, the cost of maintaining the storage, and the cost of the order. But uh, this might not match one-to-one -one the things that are in the slides. Again, as I said, it can be modeled differently. So, yeah, it's fine. And then I repeat over weeks uh, uh, this, and I will just you know evaluate how good over years my uh, my policies. So this is done in the next piece of code, and just to simulate it once. And so um, just. To initialize all the notebooks, this one, then we execute. The, uh, so here I'm I'm simulating over ten years, and each year is is made of fifty two weeks. Okay, and then what we do is just to plot the performance. Okay, so this is the cumulative revenue over weeks, and what I'm plotting here is the different years and then the average of it. So the average would be basically the value function that we uh, defined before. And you see that, well, this policy is not really doing great, right? So it decreases actually the cumulative revenue, which means that I'm actually losing over time. Then, okay, so let's try the different policy and let's see how this one performs. But now this is the one that refills only when a certain threshold is met. And then what we can see is that the performance is much better, it's actually growing, so at the end of the year, I have a positive net of around 40 units, it's actually 42 uh, units, so it works much better. So what I'm, uh, I would like you to think about is, is the following questions. And you can play around with the, with the code to, you know, test a little bit these different options, which is which policy performs best? And we have seen it, it's the second one. Why, in your opinion, it's the better one? Uh, and by you know, just playing with the code or even just thinking about it, in your opinion, what is the influence of the cost and the reward functions in the performance of the two policies? So if you want to play with the code, you can, for instance, change these constants and you can see their impact in this, uh, um, in the computation of the cost functions and the reward function. And then, you know, if you want to play the game, just try to play around with the, either with the existing policies or try to think to a different one and see how much cumulative reward it obtains. Knowing that again, for us at the moment, so how the top baseline is uh, 42 units of money, accumulated over 52 weeks on average. So I leave you a little bit of time, but uh, you know, of course, feel free to interact, ask questions, uh, but I let you, you know, a bit of time to think about the problem, and then I will come to, back to you with, uh, with questions on what are your thoughts. If we increase the value of policy constant refill, then the revenue uh, decreases. Uh, why does this occur? Uh, so, how do you increase the value of that? You mean if you execute this one and then uh, add something to to this, like uh, something? Uh, 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 this? Just to answer. Is this what you were? I need to keep shifting back, back and forth from the 
the two screens. If, if people from from remote want to, you know, mute, uh, feel free to do it. Uh, and she feel you know, instead of typing, uh, if you're comfortable. The policy can use information from long time past to compute the action. So uh, let's say, generally speaking, yes, why not? Uh, uh, in this case, the answer is no. So let's stick to the model of uh, a policy which only receives as input the current state. So there's no uh, uh, there's no memory into the policy. And then the other the other uh, answer is that it's not even needed in this problem anyway. The optimal policy is uh, um, deterministic stationary. So we can find a policy which is very good anyway. Uh, then Axel had another question. Is it reasonable to access uh, to the maximal demand value? Uh, so, mm, I would say, so from a agnostic reinforcement learning point of view, I would say no. Uh, so we would not have this prior knowledge. Then why not? I mean, if it helps out, you can you know, hope to have this type of prior knowledge uh, uh, embedded into your uh, into your design. Or, or, you know, you can consider it as a sort of an assumption that you, know, you have a guess about what is the demand uh, range. So we're uh, close to the break. So is there anybody who wants to share thoughts uh, about, about these couple of questions? Uh, or if you even had the time to try out other policies or modify uh, the two example policies. Um, so, is there anybody who's willing to share? So, why is policy two, let's say, the policy that is more conservative in uh, uh, yes. policy which is under works better? Yes, Pierre Louis with, uh, will answer, maybe. <laughs> Uh, I'm sorry, I wasn't listening. I was uh, concentrating on my own uh, question. So. Ah, okay, you may still ask your question. Uh, okay, so uh, no, I, I just wanted to say that uh, increasing the unit cost storage uh, uh, seems to, in many scenarios, I mean, the ones I, I tried uh, to, to, make, uh, the, the, to, to make us lose money. Um, I tried to adjust the thresholds with uh, uh, the the parameters like uh, unit cost order and um, and uh, unit reward, but uh, yes, this uh, this parameter, uh, the unit cost storage, uh, seems uh, seems uh, really influence. Indeed. So basically, what happens here is the fact that. Since we are paying to just you know maintain uh, this uh, this shop open with these many items, uh, and we pay proportionally to it to some extent, then it's um, we have to trade off, let's say, between the risk of missing demand because if we don't keep enough items in our store, we might be missing or, uh, you know gain opportunities, and the risk of just you know, sticking with a lot, a lot of items in our store, which is very expensive for, for anything. Plus, there is another ingredient, which is the cost of the orders. So if you looked at the code, the cost of ordering a certain order size is not linear with the order size, but it shrinks with the order size. So if we constantly refill stuff, we have two problems. One is that we pay to maintain the, the, the shop open because of the number of items we have. Second, we keep submitting a lot of very small orders, which are very expensive. If we wait until things fall below a certain threshold, on the other hand, we have less cost of maintenance, and we submit bigger chunks of orders because we always refill up to the, the top, which are less expensive. And so, like probably you're, you're suggesting, if you try to play around with the, uh, with the threshold, so just for uh, uh, recall, so if we execute 
the policy that refills up to a certain threshold goal. In this execution, it's at around 48. But imagine that, I, and, and now the threshold is basically half. Imagine that we change it to something like a tenth, which is of course, very low. Then what we get is 103, more than double the performance. Because, as you were saying, it seems like with these constants, of course, and with this type of demand, the cost of maintenance and the cost of submitting orders is the thing that is really driving the performance. How, so if anybody has an opinion, so how would they need to change the demand and or the cost of the maintenance to make you know, more frequently refilling uh, uh, strategies more profitable? Well, I can try maybe by increasing the unit reward. That's, that's one way. Uh, so if we increase the unit of reward, then it becomes less relevant the cost. And it has also another, uh, another aspect, which is uh, by increasing the, the gain of when we sell items, we are also make it uh, somehow mm -hmm more troublesome to possibly miss a demand. So imagine that we keep our, our storage always around half. And it's possible that we get you know, gigantic uh, demands from time to time, which are maybe two thirds of our storage. And basically in that case, we never able really to, to satisfy the demand. And so this is problematic. And in particular, when the reward is very large, this is a missed opportunity. And so somehow uh, uh, one, one good strategy might be to try to you know, keep things always very, very filled up when the chance of missing the opportunity of satisfying the demand is too high. But this, of course, it depends on the gain and where the demand uh, is, is located. So if it's always very, very large, then, well, let's keep the store always you know, full and at least we are sure. If the demand is very low, then we can keep it almost empty and then we will be fine. At least we will be saving the money of all big orders, oh, oh, sorry, of small orders and maintaining big storage. Okay, so this is, you know, was an example just to illustrate a little bit what it means to define a policy, what it means to evaluate its performance in a problem. And, uh, um, and, uh, and somehow, you know, to get a casting with all these ingredients. After the break, we are going to move to uh, first how to solve exactly an MDP, uh, but more importantly, how to solve it incrementally through reinforcement learning uh, learning strategy. So we are coming back at uh, at four yeah, four p.m. So, yeah. Yes. So I will be around, I will be you know, just grabbing a tea now, but if you have questions, feel free to post it in the chat, or again, I will be online. So uh, I will be just uh, stop sharing. But I'm here. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.